Greetings, legendary listeners. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that means it's time to preview Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every week, we analyze the latest chapter of the MCU from all sorts of unique angles. For Falcon and the Winter Soldier, three of our weekly shows will be returning. We're going to go ahead and pause our theory cast because, look, let's face it, some of us went overboard on theories for WandaVision. And there's really no chance that a show like Falcon and the Winter Soldier will warrant a bunch of theory crafting. But Jess and Owen will be back when the time is right, so stay tuned. Meanwhile, Character Cast returns on Monday with a preview taking stock of the fates and fortunes of all the main characters of this show. We're also going to spend way too much time dissecting that super awkward Civil War kiss between Sharon and Steve. And on Wednesday, Ponder Vision will preview all the big weird questions you didn't even know you had heading into the new series, including a deep dive on those Sokovia Accords. And we're going to totally keep the name Ponder Vision, even after WandaVision, as a nice reminder of our unforgettable time in Westview. But as always, we begin with this show, our Storycast, where we break down TV episodes not by plot, but by themes, symbols, illusions, and archetypes. You won't get this kind of analysis on any other Marvel pod or any other TV pod at all. And today, we're going to talk about the symbolism of Captain America then, now, and in the future, as well as some genres that might inform the story driving Falcon and the Winter Soldier. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and today I am joined by our two story visionaries from Salon.com, writer Amanda Marcotte. Hey, Amanda. Hey. And from her nefarious secret lair, our favorite professor of English, Dr. Maeve Adams. Hey, Dr. A. Hello. Well, the COVID stimulus passed. The president says everyone should be able to sign up for shots by May 1st. Is this the kind of governance that Steve Rogers would have been proud of? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's definitely the kind of governance that he kind of came of age under, right? Um, and in fact, there's a lot of parallels to Steve Rogers' youth and today in terms of he would have been a depression baby. He would have been um, signing up for World War II. FDR probably would have been the only good president he ever knew. Um, Hoover might have only been the other one that he ever knew. He's, he's born in World War I, right? So Hoover would have been the first president he remembers. All right, then. Well, that's a great reason to get right into this topic. So as I mentioned in our intro, I want to talk about Captain America as a symbol in terms of his past, present, and future. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, why would we talk about Captain America when a show is called Falcon and the Winter Soldier? But I don't think it's a secret that a lot of the show is going to revolve around who and whether someone should carry the mantle of Captain America, what it means and whether it's something worth fighting for. So I think interrogating Captain America as a concept is going to make a big difference in understanding and appreciating Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So then to begin, I want to start with Captain America from the past, the original Captain America, who debuted right at the turn of 1940 to 41. So Amanda, my question to you is, in terms of the original Captain America, what, if anything, was subversive or progressive about that original World War II conception of Cap? All credit to Stephen Atwell at Lawyers, Guns, and Money, because he's written a huge amount about this. But um, I think one of the things that's really important to understand is it's not just a a coincidence that Steve Rogers, the first image of him is punching a Nazi, punching Hitler. Because anti-fascism wasn't just about being an American during the war for Steve Rogers. It's, it's woven into the character, I think, a lot more thoroughly than a lot of people understand. Like Steve Rogers, as he's kind of understood in the comics, was an art student. He was somebody who wanted to sign up for the war, not just because he's a patriot, but because he very specifically was an anti-fascist. I think it's really helpful to understand a lot of the history of comic books in this era were written by Jewish Americans. They were really um, influential in the shaping of the comic book, the superhero comic book as a form. And so being anti-fascist wasn't just about being a patriot. It was an ideological stance. And I do you believe that pro-fascist forces like the KKK and stuff gave Jack Kirby so many death threats that he got police protection by the city of New York? Wow. What? That's crazy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So Captain America has never been, I think, what a lot of people who only have a very 
slight identification of the character, um, think he's just some kind of vague patriot. But in fact, it was about presenting this kind of liberal patriotism, this kind of anti-fascist patriotism that was very popular under FDR because it was really a time, I think, for like democratic Americans to kind of imagine patriotism, or at least, you know, liberal Democrats, to imagine patriotism as being about the American ideals of freedom and community and things like that. And I think that can be a little tough for modern American liberals because the right has laid so much claim to the idea of patriotism and, and what I would actually call nationalism um, that it can, we can shy away from it, but I would actually hold out Captain America as something I think we should aspire to as a character that can be used to say, like, actually, there's a way to be a patriot behind liberal ideals. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, on the one hand, there's a historical fact in World War II that progressives were, in fact, behind the move to intervene in the war. Mm, so, yeah. you know, we tend to think of of, of, of of intervention, international conflict from a progressive standpoint as something to avoid uh, until the last possible moment, right? The, that, And of course, that is kind of what happens in World War II. Um, Eddie <laughs> Izzard, the comedian, is hilarious on this, that, you know, the <laughs> Americans show up at the last minute, um, which is true, right? Like, that's the issue when it comes to sort of the history of American intervention. But the fact is, is that progressives were behind the idea of intervening in the war. And then there's, you know, something else that's sort of related to what you're talking about, Amanda, and that is that World War II in particular is a World War One and World War Two are part of a, a a kind of tricky history when it comes to the purpose of war, right? In World War Two and and in World War One, the progressive value to intervene in war was about ending imperialism in Europe, mm. not about a kind of extension of imperialist values, right? It was about it was about defending democracy across the globe, which is why the fascism angle is is crucial here. That he hates fascism, he's defending democracy. And ending imperialism or trying to sort of participate in the project to end imperialism, that those are progressive values, even ones that we recognize today. And I, I would say for people that kind of want to like engage this issue with like fiction, um, the HBO series or the book, The Plot Against America, um, is really interesting. Uh, it is an alternative history. This is not true. But what is true about it is, and I think a lot of people need to understand, is that Americans had their own fascist movement in the 1920s through the 1940s. And it was mm -hmm. mostly the mm -hmm. Klan. Um, it was uh, Charles Lindbergh. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, uh, got arrested at a fascist rally in the 1920s. Um, well, a fascist riot. A, a little like the kind his son incited uh -huh. <laughs> on the Capitol. And... This was all very real. And so I think that there's this whitewashed f story about American history where we think that everybody was against the Nazis, but actually there are the kind of debate over whether to go to Europe in World War II was along the lines of these kind of liberal versus, well, I don't want to say conservative. I want to say liberal versus straight up fascist kind of debate at the time. You know, there was a fascist rally at Madison Square Garden in the 30s. There was a lot of talk about making an alliance with the Nazis in the U.S. And so it's important to understand that Captain America was part of a discourse at the time that was a lot of people on the left saying, we need to get involved in this war and we need to be involved on England's side. Yeah. And to your point, Captain America debuted before the attack on Pearl Harbor. So it was clearly a call to action for Americans in comic form. Yeah, and especially because the the attack on Pearl Harbor is a is something that helps resolve a bunch of conflicts that are ongoing in the period between progressives who many of whom are committed to intervention because they are anti-imperialism, but on the other hand that there are all these other people who are disagreeing with them, right? Like this is not mm -hmm. We, you're exactly right, Amanda, that we have told that history as if it's a coherent tale of Americans being like, what war? 
oh, war, let's get involved, right? And then everybody sort of like comes to the table with their, you know, the women go to the factories and the men go to the battlefield and it's like this coherent project. But it was one of the most divisive, polit politically divisive times in American history. Yeah, and I would say when you know this history and you watch the first Captain America movie, First Avenger, it actually just imbues his desire to fight with so much more meaning because it's it's framed in somewhat apolitical terms in the movie. Or there's a it's a light-handed thing. So mm -hmm. that if you are conservative and you watch the first Avenger, you might not pick up on the fact that the reason Steve Rogers wants to fight in World War II is he wants to kill Nazis, specifically <laughs> fascists. It's not just that he wants to be there because the boys are there, but like he very specifically sees fascism as a threat that he wants to wipe off the face of the earth. And I think yeah. the other movies kind of build on that. And I hope and believe that Falcon and the Winter Soldier will probably build on it even more. And in fact, I feel like they have a responsibility to you because of what's happened in the past four years in this country. Yeah. And it seems as though they may be looking forward to that building on what American politics has become in the relationship to fascism. So Captain America, as originally conceived, was a huge hit all through the war. But by 1950, he was an afterthought. And Marvel Atlas Timely Comics had started to move away from superheroes almost entirely at the time. Then, of course, you fast forward and Stanley introduces the Fantastic Four. A new era of superheroes is born. And we get to the Avengers. And Captain America returns in Avengers number four. So I guess my question to you guys is, why do you think it was relevant or important to bring him back in the mid-60s after 20 years in the ice, so to speak? Because I don't know if you guys know, there's like a whole story about what, how and why Stan Lee brought him back. Yeah, I have no idea. So could you just, I, it would really help me if you could just elaborate that a little sure, bit. Sure, sure. Yeah, yes. I can bullshit about the whys and the meaning, but uh -huh. I just need to know the facts here. Correct. <laughs> well, you know, I, contrary to popular belief, I wasn't around at the time. But what, what I do know, I know, shocking. In late 1963, <laughs> Stan Lee told a story in one of his Strange Tales comics where the Human Torch encounters Captain America. But it turns out to be this bad guy called the Acrobat who was just impersonating Captain America. But then mm. literally at the end of the comic, Stan Lee is like, hey, this is basically a tryout for Captain America. Please let me know if you would like Captain America to return. And apparently fans said, yes, we would really like it. There was apparently a ton of enthusiasm around bringing back Captain America. So he literally did a kind of tryout for the character in an issue where if it had not worked out, it would have been really low stakes. But then they bring him back and they not only bring him back, they invent this whole backstory about how he'd been frozen in ice and Bucky had died. And they bring him back in the Avengers in early 64. So it was a really interesting choice for them to retcon this whole frozen in ice thing, which has become a huge component of his tale now. But I just think it's really interesting that they chose to bring him back in the 60s after 15 years of being on the shelf and almost 20 years since he was really relevant. And I was just curious if you guys had any speculation as to why he would have seemed relevant to folks in the mid 60s again. Can I ask a quick question that mm -hmm. I don't I, you may not have the answer to this, but do we know anything about what the readership of this was in the 1960s? My loose knowledge is that we have a couple audiences for Marvel Comics back then, much like we do now. One is the younger folks, teenagers of the 60s who got way into Captain America uh, through these comics in the 60s, or the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, right? Those mm. books that really drew young people in. But I also suspect they had a large audience of silent generation readers who were those original World War II comic book buyers. And I would not be surprised if this was basically the first nostalgia play in comic books, or at least in sort of what we recognize as modern comic books, right? So... In the way that as someone from Gen X, I'm very nostalgic about so much of what they're doing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because of the comics of my youth. If you yeah. grew up on Captain America in the 40s and then came back to comics when Marvel got hip and cool in the mid 60s, one of the things you might really enjoy is this idea of bringing back the character from your childhood, just like I freaked out the first time Vision popped up in Age of Ultron. We know one reader of Marvel <laughs> Comics at the time. Say more. Uh, uh, a fun fact, George R. R. Martin uh, was a young person mm. and he wrote letters to Marvel that were published in the 60s, writing about how much he liked the Fantastic Four. That's, That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, you know, like, 
I understand we're off into a little bit of speculation space, but just knowing what we know about the early to mid 60s, I was just curious if you had any hypotheses about why Captain America would seem worth bringing back for the readership. Well, you know, one thing is interesting. You said that, you know, we definitely have some silent generation readers or people who participated in the war, Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we were saying before about what happens in the period leading up to the war, right? So in the period leading up to the war, there's a, a great deal of political turmoil and and division, divisiveness around the question about whether or not we enter the war. And the war essentially creates an occasion for everybody to put aside their political differences for the point of the survival, not only of the people at war and their feeling of, you know, their feeling that they're supported by the American public, but also the the persistence of America as an idea. And so there's a kind of, I think there's a cynical way of reading this nostalgia. Hmm. And that is for, um, you know, because we're talking about the 1960s, a period of, again, political divisiveness, probably the most politically divisive period since the period right before America enters the war. So maybe there's a kind of nostalgia for that, uh, that hope that America can come together, find a common cause, And, you know, move into a space where our values are aligned again. And Captain America might be a kind of symbol of that. I mean, that's that's not a view I love insofar (laughs) as, you know, I think Captain America and the stories that might come out of it, not necessarily in civil Captain America Civil War, because good Lord, please no. Um, But, you know, the, the idea of Captain America as a figure who doesn't just stand for us kind of acquiescing to American ideology, but standing in, as Amanda was saying, for a kind of set of progressive values um, that we, you know, that might even include inclusiveness of uh, inclusiveness of political division rather than a desire to kind of flatten divisiveness into, you know, norms that are exclusive and oppressive and all of that. Well, and I, you know, I would point out that there's a big difference in between the early 60s when Captain America comes back and then the late 60s, which is when we think of the 60s and we think of Vietnam and we think of a lot of the turmoil and, and political misery. Like the early 60s, I think that there was a lot of people kind of like liberals, again, who probably had a lot of nostalgia for that Captain America slash FDR like 40s idea of Mm -hmm. America as a force for good around the world, like a force for democracy, a force for liberal values. This is also a time when the civil rights movement was succeeding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's a lot of optimism in the early 60s. I think we somewhat forget about the idea that America can be a better place. Mm. Yeah. And especially sort of along the lines of, you know, FDR, principles that I think we tend to, I mean, we tend to kind of forget about what made FDR so crucial to the formation of American progressive principles that, you know, he brings in this idea that we could have a fully functioning welfare state (laughs) in America. (laughs) And that's- Which again, JFK also believed. Yeah, that's LBAJ also believed. Yeah. And, you know, what's, what's, What's sort of, I think, crucial about that is it aligns with, I mean, obviously, given what you're saying, and also just we we know this to be true, that aligns with progressive values that extend the welfare state to all people who actually live here, mm-hmm. regardless of whether or not, you know, some people don't conceive of them as belonging to the American state, right? So an, a truly inclusive welfare state. I mean, this is why FDR wants to write a second Bill of Rights, yeah. Right at the end of his presidency, he, he he says, look, we've got freedom of speech. We've got freedom of religion. We've got, you know, we've got we've got a security state. But the other two that have right. been forgotten, freedom from want, freedom from fear. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And the freedom from want is what FDR adds and says, because, you know, yes, there's the whole pursuit of happiness bit, you know, in, you know, the founding documents of the American Republic. But there is nothing in the Bill of Rights that guarantees that there is freedom from want. There is freedom from fear because you cannot be oppressed by your own state and the American state will act as a security agent for you in the rest of the world. But those are truly liberal values. And yeah. Yeah. And if a lot of people forget that 
that that famous Norman Rockwell painting yes. where the people are sitting at dinner yes. for the Thanksgiving and the, the the older couple is holding up the turkey. That was actually part of a four-part series of paintings that Rockwell did for the four freedoms. There's freedom yeah. of religion, freedom of speech, freedom from fear, which is the parents putting the child to bed. And then the Thanksgiving dinner was freedom from want. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about Captain America now. MCU Steve Rogers, I believe, is more popular probably than his comics character was. Now, I don't think there's a scientific way to evaluate this. So if you prefer cooler, we can go with cooler. <laughs> Steve Rogers is cooler than the comics character ever was. And part of the reason I say that is most of the good Marvel properties had been snapped up by other film studios over the years, which is why it took so long to get the X-Men back. And we have this complicated deal to have Spider-Man in these movies. So just economically speaking, Captain America was just available because nobody else chose to buy him. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that he was an, in hot demand before the MCU came along. And now Steve Rogers is like an American icon. Why was MCU Steve Rogers so much more popular than the comics character ever was? Right. So I'm going to go galaxy brained a little on this. <laughs> okay. There's kind of three phases of Steve Rogers, right? There's FDR Steve Rogers. There's JFK slash LBJ Steve Rogers. And then there is Barack Obama Steve Rogers. Yeah. <laughs> and all three of those eras have something very important in common, which was all three were times that regardless of whatever the political realities were in D.C., the kind of mood of the country was that liberal values were ascendant, that we were actually getting past some of ra our racial divisions that have ruined this country for so long, that we are reinvesting in the idea of a common good, and that we're reinvesting in the FDR's ideas of the four freedoms. So I think it actually, okay. it might have been a happy accident of IP that they went with Captain America, but I think he captured people's imaginations for the same reason that he always has, because it was a, t a time of liberal optimism that we could, you know, claim the flag for yeah. our values. Yeah. And be proud, right? So can you, I mean, what's sort of, what's inside of that is, can we imagine a Captain America story that people would have gone to see movies about that was made under George W. Bush? Ooh, God. <laughs> Hell that's... no. I mean, yeah, you know, that's... we're all out in the street protesting war. Like, this is not a time to celebrate American Americanness. And I'm not saying that it's not a time to celebrate those American progressive values, because it is always a time to celebrate freedom <laughs> from want. On the other hand, right, like, it's just hard to imagine writing that story or selling that story. So you can imagine, you know, people are like, I have an idea. Let's write a story about Captain America that is going to like try to retrieve that during George W. Bush. And maybe he'll be like an anti-colonial freedom fighter. And you can imagine people being like, that's a great idea. And then going to the studios and the studios being like, no, <laughs> yeah, that's not be right now. Audiences would kind yeah. of be like, but it was fun yeah. to go see the first Avenger during the Obama years because yes. it was... It was an uncomplicated pleasure to sit down and wallow in the idea that that Americans could be that again, the kind of people that only go to war when it's necessary and only go to war for freedom and not for Vietnam, not for Iraq, none of this other bullshit. Well, and also aren't like, you know, I we all remember the day that Obama was elected. It felt like freedom from the idea that America was just this violent imperializer, that there was a there was some hope left in the American experiment, that we could be proud, you know, not in a kind of jingoistic way, but we could be proud to be American because we we do we do do some really great things, like yeah. Yeah. elect the first African American president of the United States. We did that, and it was a hopeful time. And I think that there's something really crucial about that in when Captain America the movies start getting remade. No, I think you guys are making some great points about when progressivism and patriotism merged in the 40s, a bit in the 60s around the civil rights movement, and again, on the Obama presidency. That makes a lot of sense. The other yeah. thing I was thinking about, though, is how Captain America was never counterculture. A lot of the Marvel characters were, the X-Men in particular, were speaking to folks who felt 
ostracized and excluded. And Captain America, by his very nature, was, you know, the blonde haired, blue eyed. Yeah. You know, sure, he started out as a scrawny kid, but even that is just another way to push him towards this idealized version of, you know, a white guy in America in, in the mid century. And so I just think it was also hard for that to seem like a really exciting property. Whereas under Obama, I think it became a little bit more acceptable to be wonky and interested in earnest things like improving the country. And in in a way that had its own little bit of counterculture to go ahead and say, no, I actually do yeah. want to fight for people uh, and their well-being who aren't me. I don't know. Is that making any sense? Well, yeah, I would complicate it a little. You can't separate Captain America, the mythology, from the scrawny kid who gets a super soldier serum, period. Yeah. From yeah. the art student, very specifically the art yeah. student. He also becomes like, a professor later, just to throw that in there, because you know. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <Professor. laughs> art student, professor, Brooklyn kid... Uh, again, there's um, a lot of signifiers kind of tied up in there that have lost some of their salience that would have been important in the 1940s. But yeah. the main thing is like, it is the very notion that... Well, that character, I think, was the popular version. I think the 40s yeah. version is the only one that ever even claimed, came close to rivaling MCU Steve Rogers. Yeah. But, you know, Ed Brubaker, for example, in the mid-2000s, in mm. 2005, I think, started writing Captain America. Everyone should read it. It's an incredible run. That's when the Winter Soldier first appears. But Captain yeah. America doesn't really have a full-fledged personality. He doesn't really yeah. have a human side. Yeah, he's a guy out of time. He cares about his friends these sort of generic broad brush concepts of his personality, but he doesn't really seem yeah. as human as Steve does in the movies. Yeah. In the movies. And, and I, I think that that's exactly the key to it, which is that like countercultures kind of the better ones always strive to be the culture. Hmm. Right. And yeah. so the whole Steve Rogers goes from scrawny art student to the symbol of America that's kind of the aspiration that kind of like wonky liberals have, right? And and an aspiration that Obama seemed to be, right. I think, the answer to. Like Obama was, in a lot of ways, a countercultural figure in that sense. Like not in the yeah. the like deeper way, but he's a, a black man. Mm -hmm. He's an intellectual. Yeah. He mm -hmm. didn't talk like a normal politician. He he talked like a a, a law professor. <laughs> Yeah, but he's also a square, and so is Steve Rogers. In the yeah. comics, there's no version of Steve Rogers, at least since the mid-40s, where he wasn't kind of a square. And so, I don't know, it's just so... Yeah, this is the Peace Corps ideal. <laughs> yeah. Like, the right. this is definitely the, like, the, like, Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. ideal of kind of, like, a counterculture. The square kind, you know, not the party, not the party animal, not the hippie, but, like, certainly the... But stir not the not the kind of mainstream conservative Eisenhower type. I mean, there's something else that's kind of hopeful for me, at least, about the the vision that we get of Captain America in the films is that he's um, he's also not your standard kind of two dimensional American man, right? He's hmm. he's got he's he's not just like a scrawny dude who wants to enter the war because he's you know he's got some sort of principled position on war, he's he's a really good friend and he's deeply close to his friend Bucky and their relationship is like, there's something, there's an intimacy in their relationship, an emotional intimacy. They know each other emotionally. And that that's hopeful when it comes to us thinking about the way we revise masculinity in the modern world, that men, men can have deep, emotional, intimate relationships with other men. Um, and they can also, you know, and of course it extends in the films and so in these slightly kind of, they're a little bit token scenes, but I think they're important too, that these men don't treat women like shit. Right. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, there's just something kind of nice about the fact that there's a, a, the, one of the, the iconic American hero is not a man's man. He's a man's man, right? He's a friend. Yeah. It was critical to have Peggy Carter. In First Avenger. Yeah. Like, she's a critical character in terms of making the modern Steve Rogers so appealing, right? His, he's He has a relationship with a woman who's his equal, 
let's talk about the values of MCU Steve Rogers, because again, I think they're going to be hanging like a cloud or at least a weight around the neck of both Sam and Bucky in this series. I want to table Civil War for a second, but in general, what would you say are the values of MCU Steve Rogers? Equality, freedom, um, humanity, like humanism. He's a, mm-hmm. he's a classic humanist, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about civil war, but in everything but civil war, there's a commitment to the idea that human relationships, not just ones you've had historically, but also whatever human relationships you form in a moment in terms of a uh, social bond, those things matter. They matter more than some abstract principle that might drive you to do you know, to sort of accept an order, for example, right? Like he's not a he's not a figure that just um, takes orders and then apologizes later on the grounds that well, I was told to do it, and I, you know, so there, yeah. there, there it is. Yeah, he believes it's the the model the citizen the model of the citizen is a, a free thinker, right? Yeah, yeah. I think he has a lot of loyalty throughout all of his movies. Um, yeah. and that's a big quality, and I think that does reflect on some of the Civil War things that we'll talk about. But I also think he's a big fan of transparency and Mm. there's some qualities about honesty maybe is a more generic way to put that, whether that's in his relationships or whether what it's something that he expects from the government. So those are those I think you guys have listed some really great values that drive Steve Rogers. I'm guessing most fans are fine with where Steve Rogers lands in Civil War, but Ugh. our household has been rent asunder over this. I also, <laughs> well, actually, we're not really divided. We're just more always been trying to make sense of it since it came out. So Steve Rogers, the same guy who was like, hey, S.H.I.E.L.D. shouldn't be out here making all these helicarriers uh. in secret, creating all these programs to do stuff without public awareness is the same guy who turns around and says, I don't want to be accountable to the citizenry of the world uh, and I refuse to sign these Sokovia Accords. So I'm just curious how Civil War's Captain America can square with the values we were just talking about in terms of equality and citizenry as this value and stuff like that. Is there, or does it just seem utterly out of place to you guys? It's a tough question because I think there is a story that you can tell that it's easy, like going to the f- like when you watch First Avenger, when you read Captain America comics after Watergate, Captain America was so disillusioned um, in the comics with the U.S. government that he actually changes his name and stops being Captain America. So it has always been a part of the character that corruption yeah. is a concern and mm-hmm. he he gets disillusioned with the government when corruption is rising, right? And that's a big part of Winter Soldier, right? Is he is the story of him seeing S.H.I.E.L.D. get corrupted by HYDRA. And I think you can tell a story to yourself where Civil War and the Sokovia Accords makes sense in, in terms of he went so... He, he starts as a patriotic character who believes in the value of institutions to protect his values of freedom, equality, et cetera. He gets disillusioned in Winter Soldier and in Civil War, he's so far to the other side that he can't see the wisdom of having accountability over the Avengers, which I would argue is critical to the kind of liberal value system that C. Rogers is about, right? Like the the notion that the UN, that the nations of the world should have, that the people should have a say <laughs> over whether superheroes come into their community and start beating people up should be a Captain America value. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I could see that story. The problem for me is as much as I like that movie, I don't think that Steve ever articulates that. And we never get to in, we never actually, I I don't know if they didn't have the courage of their convictions or whatnot to have him go across the line to like be a flawed character who is, has become poisoned by corruption to the point where he himself doesn't want accountability yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Like the if we were to draw the arc of Captain America, it's a it's a story about a person who uh, basically commits himself like a good soldier to the state because he not just because, you know, he wants to be a soldier, but because he believes in the principles of American democracy and he essentially over time becomes more and more disillusioned with the state. Mm-hmm. Right? That's that's the arc of the Captain America story that ends with when, with a uh, civil war. 
the pro, you know, and, 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 and look, that's, that's a story that I can get into, right? Like I also am <laughs> disillusioned yeah. with the American state and its capacity to not only provide security for all the people of America, all the people of America, but also to, to genuinely live by its own values, right? I am skeptical about that right now. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we can move back towards a place where we're, we're, we're sort of reachieving those values. So I, so I get that, I get that idea that maybe like what essentially is happening is that there are legitimate reasons to be skeptical with the, the American state. But you don't go to libertarianism. Exactly. This is not an Ayn Rand novel. Like, good <laughs> right. Lord, preserve us from a defense of libertarianism. I yeah. also think one of the key differences is, look, if you turn to General Thunderbolt Ross, you don't want that guy telling you what to do. He has a terrible agenda. The problem is we're not talking about Thunderbolt Ross being in control. We're talking about people like the Nigerian citizens yes. who were attacked when Lagos had Wanda's bomb go off. Yes, mostly Wakandans died because they were on that particular floor, but it was the Nigerian people who had their sovereignty violated. And the idea that Steve would be against the Nigerian people having a say as to whether these American heroes yes. come in and wage war on their territory feels much more problematic than just saying, fuck you, General Ross. I mean, what he said, one of the things he says is, if I lost a bunch of nuclear weapons, I'd have to answer for that. And it's yes, like, and you, you as an audience are like, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah that's good. Yeah, you I'm here, I'm here for that. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. I'm actually worried it. you wouldn't have to, and that would really <laughs> suck, so... Yeah. And then and meanwhile, Steve, you know, Steve Rogers is like, but I want to be able to make my own decisions. And you're like, dude, no, no. I mean, fine. Yes, I get it. I get where you're coming from because, okay, Winter Soldier leaves us in a place where the American state has failed in its obli and, and its institutions, mm -hmm. not the whole American state, but the institutions of the modern American state have failed. The people have failed. The Avengers have put everybody at risk. Yeah. Right. But on the other hand, it's like, no, we don't then say, I mean, you know, it would be a little bit like the end of World War II. We're like, end of World War II. We're like, so yeah, um, so we have a problem with nations getting too much power, right? <laughs> and imperializing over people. And then, you know, someone comes in and is like, I have an idea, the United Nations. It's a very good one. We're going to form a coalition of nations that oversees power distribution in the world. Yeah. Right. And everyone's like, Excellent idea. And meanwhile, I don't know, you know, whatever the United States is like, or some other country is like, no, but I want to be able to make my own decisions. We would all be like, no, no. that is a yeah. terrible plan. And you can see that it's, it's, yeah, exactly. Like, I think if they had done just a little bit more work in the movie to articulate it as a concern about corruption and wanting yes. more safeguards. Yes. But instead, what we get is suddenly Steve Rogers is a libertarian. Suddenly, Steve Rogers has turned his back on all of his values and to articulate an incoherent ideology that, yeah, he just, it just doesn't fit. He's a smart man. He should be a smart man. Yeah. Yeah. He, not to go Filetti theater on you, that's something the character <laughs> cast, but just imagine if he'd said something like, for the first 99 times that United Nations sends us out, maybe that's fine, but you give them time and it's only a matter of time until Hydra comes in yes. or a new version of Hydra. And then that hundredth time we're being sent out on a mission of genocide or something terrible. And I yes. can't take that risk, yeah. right? If you get one line like that in the middle of that conversation changes the entire context of this and we're no longer worried about Ayn Rand, Steve Rogers. Yeah. Or we're moving too fast or something. Yeah. Right. But I will say this. There is a streak throughout all of the movies of Steve Rogers trusting his instincts over all authority, including the American government. So, for example, he repeatedly tries to cheat his way into the U.S. military as skinny Steve Rogers. He <laughs> lies about where he's from and who he is and who his family is and what is wrong with him to do anything he can because he believes he should be over there fighting. Then... A general in the U.S. Army is like, go stand over there. And he's like, no, thanks. I want to go save my buddy, Bucky, which, to be fair, is basically what happens in the heart of civil war. So he totally ignores all authority, runs off on a half-cocked mission without thinking it through, and totally pulls it off because, well, you know, what is more American than that? And I do think there's an argument that this is part of that human quality of Steve Rogers that I, I was kind of alluding to earlier. And a way to look at it is it is the ugly side of America, is our yeah. hubris, 
and our willingness to fly by the seat of our pants and to think that we know better for quote unquote good reasons when really we're often hurting people around us without realizing it. That's the best case I can make. This is story cast, so this is where I can put on my my <laughs> my my narrative uh, <laughs> literary cap and say this. She's is, actually wearing it, guys. It's yeah, a, it's a cap. It's a weird. I'm not even going to describe it to you. <laughs> this this was a missed opportunity for them to explore the fact that this was that this is a personality trait of Steve's, and it has good sides and bad sides, right? Yeah. Like you said, it's a human characteristic. And yes, they could have totally... And, and I think once Bucky gets involved in Civil War, it, the movie gets back on the rails because now it's about this relationship and not an ideological argument anymore. It's a great And point. that's fine. My problem is they just couldn't commit to allowing this to be a flaw of Steve's. And instead, it's just presented as an obvious argument and it's really really not but they also could have just to go back to mark's point earlier about you know sort of objecting to an order that you don't agree with they could have actually aligned it with a with a a long tradition of conscientious objection in america we have a long Mm. tradition of that like fine yes i'm all for instrumentalizing flaws and turning them into narrative possibilities i think those are that's that I mean, that some of the richest narrative explores the outcomes of personality flaws. But I feel like there's also a possibility that this isn't the ugly side of America. I mean, sorry, guys. I, I mean, I know you're on the same team as me, but I think libertarianism is the ugly side of America. Yeah, one of exactly. the it's biggest, true. like most dis- vile parts of American uh, democracy. Uh, I mean, not that democracy needs libertarianism, but it's one thing that we have. But one thing that is truly magnificent and beautiful is the way that um, conscientious objection has turned into a political value in its own right. And to not capitalize on that, what a what a missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a complicated question. And they and what's interesting is Tony Stark's arc in this movie is perfect which is yeah. like they do a good job of showing that Tony's strengths as a person are also his weaknesses mm-hmm. that sometimes his ability to like be a conscientious objector has worked out. And then sometimes it has backfired. It's just for whatever reason, I don't think they wanted to do that with Steve. Although and it's, it was an, it was a missed opportunity because yeah. then you could have also told a story about how these two men are way more alike than they think they are. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say about Tony Stark is that it participates in a narrative trope or habit in American television and film where at the end of the end of Civil War is, you know, him basically trying to kill Bucky for killing his parents when he wasn't in control of his mind. And that's just a a sloppy narrative. It's like we were talking about this before, right? John Locke. Right says that you're not responsible for your actions if you weren't conscious at the time. I mean, I don't object to it because that's, like I said, after they get out of the ideological arguments in Civil War, I have no objections to that movie because everything is human. Right. right? Yeah. And Tony right. is furious and Cap hid that from him. And yeah, I will say, I don't understand why Bucky is so unwilling to stand in front of Tony and at least take a punch to the face, given that he did kill his parents. You know, he, he's so quick to run away. I, I feel like that's yeah. the strangest choice I quibble with. But look, we can argue about civil wars and perfections all day. I think that there's a lot of really interesting stuff. And I have to say, it's wild to hear Amanda earlier make such an incredible case for the arc of Steve Rogers, knowing full well how frustrated you are by their execution. (laughs) So Marvel Studios, if you're listening, Amanda is available to consult on your story development. (laughs) Let's talk about the next Captain America. What values should that next Captain America champion? Um, so I don't know how many folks in the listening audiences have read Captain America, Sam Wilson. Um, I've been rereading it because of the show and one of the initial arcs in the comic series, I really hope they explore is that he does embrace the notion that you cannot be a patriot and not be political. And he, he embraces progressive values and very specifically embraces anti-racism as a value. 
And he gets in a lot of trouble for it because he has an expansive view of anti-racism, which is also um, pro-immigrant, pro, immigrant, pro mm-hmm. um, and he goes and he saves people that are immigrating across the U.S.-Mexican border from white supremacists. And this is in 2015, so it's kind of when Trump is rising and it's it's very related to a lot of things that were happening at the border. Trump just didn't come out of nowhere. Like there were militias along the border that were attacking people that were attacking people that were trying to provide medical care and assistance to immigrants that were crossing the border. So it's it's interesting and relevant and kind of predicted what was going to be happening over the next few years. And I think that I would hope that Sam Wilson's character, that is a huge part of this character, because I think that's a very interesting question to me, is how do you be Captain America in a divided country? And I think along those lines, if, if you know, this is a show that is, seems to me so far, I mean, I, you know, we haven't seen an episode of it. No screeners for us yet. <laughs> Come on, uh, Marvel. <laughs> hello, Marvel. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we have, uh, we have a, an African American Captain America. We have a, a, a working class Winter Soldier. Um, I would, I hope that the show is as transparent as it can be. I mean, look, WandaVision was was pretty radical right? Like pretty subversive. Let's, let's own where we are in the world and let's talk about how power and privilege operate. Let's be attentive to the fact that there are people who are given power and there are people who are treated as instruments of power. And I'm hoping, I mean, I have a lot of hope because, you know, WandaVision kind of blew me away. Um, So I have a lot of hope that this, that they are going to reckon with that in a really sort of explicit way. You know, and I always think of the Amanda Gorman phrase from the inauguration, a nation unfinished. It's a straightforward way to acknowledge that we've never been perfect, often far from perfect, lots of mistakes in our past, while saying that there's a tremendous opportunity to do something about all of that. A nation unfinished is what I'm hoping this Captain America represents. Captain America Obama years was a reflection of, I think, a lot of naivety. Mm-hmm. Yeah, among us that we thought that we could just progress without backlash that this that and this is the same naivety that was in evident in the 40s and in the early 60s every you know you get JFK then you get Richard Nixon we got Barack Obama then we get Donald Trump so yeah. i hope that this show can actually grapple with the fact that like that kind of everything that we want that all our hopes and dreams that we poured into Captain America, like I don't fault any of us for it. That's a wonderful, beautiful thing. But all at a certain point, you know, it's time to put away childish things and to think about the fact that it was never that clean. It was never that simple. So then given those values, what kinds of foes should the next Captain America oppose? Can I just say this? that I would like to see Captain America punching Nazis. I mean, I'd like it to come (laughs) full circle, right on, around, and around we go. Best possible callback. You know, folks have said, like, let's not call Trump a fascist. I'd like to call Trump a fascist. I I certainly want to call him an authoritarian, Mm -hmm. right? And if the thing is with, you know, with Captain America is if what he does is he joins the fight every time against America's biggest foe, then certainly one of America's biggest foes right now is authoritarianism and the and the the bending of American democracy to and not towards because democracy does not bend towards authoritarianism naturally. Mm. It takes effort mm. by you know charismatic leaders, unfortunately, like Donald Trump. Like I, I think right now, right, like this is that moment in the horror movie where the call is coming from inside the house, right? (laughs) Oh my God. You know, it's not, you know, this is not Nazis from abroad. This is Nazis at home, right here. The call is coming from inside the house and Captain America needs to answer that call. Hell yeah. And punch a Nazi, sorry. And to bring it back to the beginning of the podcast episode, when Captain America first punched Hitler... Hitler was not actually our, I mean, he wasn't our friend. (laughs) (laughs) 
but we weren't we God, weren't at no. war with Germany yet, and there were a lot of people in the U.S. Yeah. that were still kind of pro Hitler, and so the call was kind of co- like that. That comic book cover was actually a fuck you to American born, uh, like American born and bred Nazis, mm-hmm. and prevarication around Nazis. Yeah, and they recognized it at the time as just that thing. So who else should Captain America be fighting? I mean, if we're going to go off the comics, it would be very cool to see um, Sam Wilson and uh, Bucky Barnes go after uh, militia, American militia movements, American white supremacists, just like Maeve said, American Nazis. It's probably, if that's what they do, then it's going to f- feel super resonant. Just the way that WandaVision ended up feeling super resonant with the quarantine after the insurrection on the Capitol, if they actually followed the comics and kind of had Sam Wilson attacking like right-wing militia movements, I think it will feel spectacularly um, of the moment because that's literally like the biggest threat in this country right now. Yeah. I think I would like to see him punch the fascist version of Captain America in the face. And I think I might get that chance because there does appear to be a bad guy or at least another character named U.S. Agent who might be walking around representing the sort of old school, maybe not Lindbergh level bad, but something between Lindbergh and Reagan level bad (laughs) version of American patriotism. So I'm hoping for a battle between symbols. My last question for you guys on Captain America is whether it's possible to tell stories of patriotism in this moment, given everything we've gone through as a nation, and if so, how do we tell those stories? That is a that is a tricky yeah, one. Just a quick one. Just I know, a quick just a little, quick like let's throw that just, away. Uh, um, just, uh, you know, I mean, there is a there is a larger question about whether or not American national identity is still one that is committed to liberatory principles, inclusive principles, and I I believe it. I I believe it can be, but Captain America's patriotism, you know, in the form of Sam, needs to be about all the things that we were talking about at the very beginning, that idea that, that the American state is committed to a freedom from want, right, in all, in all senses, and in fact is an inc- inclusively freedom from want. Um, yeah. If that's, if that's not happening, and I, and I just, look, I mean, We've, we've all seen the same clips, right? I mean, it's tough. You can't really imagine Captain America punching poverty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can't. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. I, I tried to imagine that. It's not happening. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I just, I think that there, if it delivers on the promise that WandaVision has made to us, that it is going to reckon with the hardest ideologies, the most entrenched ideologies of American identity and power, then yes, it will offer us a new way of thinking about what it means to be patriotic. That isn't just that thing we did during Obama's administration where it was great, right? Like it felt so nice for a little while where we were all like, oh, look, America isn't a shithole ideologically. (laughs) It's not the monstrous monstrosity that we thought it was. It's not so bad, right? We need to actually imagine something utterly different, a truly inclusive society and a patriotism that goes along with that. Yeah. To your point, I would say Captain America to me has always represented this notion that there is an, uh, an ideal of patriotism that is a liberal, liberatory patriotism. He's popular at times when that seems to be possible in American, the American imagination. Yeah. So what I would say is what I hope this show can do is recognize that that's a good thing to want and a good thing to believe in, but it's never going to just be easy. You have to fight for that vision of America. And, and I think that Considering what has happened in the past year in this country with Black Lives Matter, um, with the attacks on voting rights that are going on right now, with Stacey Abrams in Georgia kind of convincing America that if we actually had an inclusive, a more racially inclusive version of America, we are a step closer to all these other ideals that Mm. we have. Yeah. Um, I think that there is an opportunity to tell a story that's about the fight. For American identity instead yeah. of just assuming that like 
instead of the fantasy that the fight is kind of in the past. I think yeah. that's a great, a great way to describe what we hope to see from this next version of Captain America. So let's talk about some genres. So I'm sure like WandaVision, maybe not quite as many genres will show up, but several genres might be possible. And I cannot wait to break them all down with you when they arrive. But I want to talk about a couple that I do think will definitely come into play. Since we were just talking about Captain America and Steve Rogers and the whole iconography of this character for the last 80 plus years, there's no question that part of this will be a story about inheriting the mantle. And I figured I would ask my two story geniuses, what are some of the most iconic or classic stories about inheriting the mantle that this show might draw on? I mean, there's uh, these, those stories have been around, um, for arguably as long as we have had civil society, right? Hmm. How do yeah. we pass power from one person to another, right? So Shakespeare has his own version of this and Henry IV, parts or one Hamlet. and two. Yeah, or Hamlet. <laughs> Although I think, you know, I mean, people often like dismiss the history plays as boring. Henry IV is my favorite. If we take Henry IV, part one and two, it is my favorite history play hmm. of all the uh, it's all it's my favorite Shakespeare play of all Shakespeare's plays because it is a story about what happens when somebody who you know just wants to drink with his buddies has to become king mm -hmm. and so how does he negotiate the transfer of himself not the transfer of power but the transfer him of himself from a place of just a normal dude to being monarch of all of England and the the play really gets into the nitty gritty of what it means to actually care for the people that you govern, right? On the other hand, Henry IV is not a good play if what we're thinking about is how do we understand the passing of power in the modern world, right? Like monarchy is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy is great. I mean, I think that we could just say that. That's not a that's not a hard judgment to make, right? And so, you know, I think one of the one of the things that's interesting about this as a as a story about passing authority on, passing the mantle, passing privilege and power, all of that, is that it has to belong to its own moment. Yeah. What do you mean? So most passing the mantle stories either, are either kind of conservative fantasies about shoring up what we think is the right kind of power. So Henry the Henry the Fourth, right, is a story about monarchy that ultimately justifies. I mean, if you read the play, it's actually not about Henry or Henry V. It's about Queen Elizabeth, right? Because Shakespeare is yeah. writing for Queen Elizabeth. So it's a way of justifying the transition ultimately to a woman who has power, in rooting it in the history of passing power because God said so. Mm -hmm. Right. So conservative fantasies or contemporary reflections on problems in the passing of power. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we think about something like Buffy the Vampire Slayer is to, to, to take mm. us into a totally different example. Right. Is a story about a girl who comes into power that she doesn't want, clearly, um, and who takes on the mantle of that authority. And in the final season, in the I think it's in the final episode. It is the final episode. Yeah, and it's and it's also sort of enacted over the course, it's justified over the course of that episode. Why does it have to be just one? Why can't we why can't we multiply this power in the world? And of course she affects that, right? And so it's a fantasy about the idea that you know, what you know, it's a reflection on the way in which we think about authority as inherited or earned and unproblematized um transitions of power. So the, the last episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer is just truly one of the greatest things of modern pop culture. And it goes back true. to what we talked about at the end <laughs> of WandaVision. And about during our WandaVision podcast, we talked a lot about how the hero's journey of Joseph Campbell is just not appropriate for women. A lot of the, it just doesn't work for all sorts of reasons because it's a conservative masculinist fantasy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Buffy brilliantly exploded that because it, it basically called out the the bullshit of the can only be one. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and pointed out that women's power, like that's a that's a fantasy that a pa a patriarchal fantasy of the hero 
the singular hero, the king, the prince, the Luke Skywalker, the whatever, right? Yeah. Whereas on Buffy, it was the 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 point of the show throughout its entire se- series was that that's actually burdensome, deadly, and miserable, mm-hmm. and it it offered a feminist vision of solidarity. Yeah, and and that. W- instead of one person having power over others, we all get more power by amplifying each other's power. Right. Yeah. And, and that women come together and, and in solidarity. And I, the last episode really blew up the hero's journey narrative and told a very different story about community solidarity and, and reimagining um, instead of just p- doing the girl power thing of just plugging women into men's stories, actually telling stories where women question patriarchy and remake the world in our image. And I think this is going to be a show about men. And I hope that, but that doesn't mean it can't do that because men are also oppressed by these narratives, uh, oppressed by these systems. And I hope that they can have a little fun with, with it because you know again nobody is actually captain america they are just inheriting the mantle of him and and it's never they're never going to be steve rogers he's a unique figure can yeah. we tell the story without redoing the hero's journey but instead telling a more interesting story about community partnership friendship etc is there a work in this category you'd like to see used as inspiration for this, Maeve, out of the Inheriting the Mantle stories? I mean, to go, you know, to go back to something I was saying a minute ago, um, if these stories, if the kind of standard inherit, Inheriting the Mantle story is not a fantasy, a conservative fantasy about something we're just going to, you know, hold on to with, you know, with an iron, you know, over my dead body kind of grip, mm-hmm. Um if they are a contemporary reflection in their best moments, right? If they are a contemporary reflection on a problem in the world that they're going to offer a unique solution to, then I, I hope not. I hope they are not invoking some older version of this. And I hope that they are telling a story about what it means to inherit or earn power in a world where a Black American is Captain America and a working class kid, a working class white boy um, is his buddy. I mean, I hope I, I, and I, and I think that there's a, there's an enormous amount of potential for thinking about the, 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 the subversiveness of that in a narrative about American patriotism. So in a trailer that they've released recently, they really play up the buddy angle of this show. Well, I don't trust Red Wing. You Hold on a minute. You don't have to trust Red Wing, but I'm gonna go see if he's right. Cause I have a feeling they might be a part of the big three. What big three? The big three. What big three? Androids, aliens, and wizards. That's not a thing. That's definitely a thing. No, it's not. Every time we fight, we fight one of the three. So who are you fighting now, Gandalf? How do you know about Gandalf? I read The Hobbit in 1937 when it first came out. So you see my point? No, I don't. There are no wizards. Dr. Strange is a sorcerer. (laughs) A sorcerer is a wizard without a hat. Think about it, right? I'm right. I, I just I just came up with that. It's crazy. And America has told a zillion of these buddy stories, especially in the last 30 or 40 years. I'm just curious what you guys think about the buddy stories that they might draw on. What are some of the classic or iconic buddy stories that might be influential? Uh, the one that comes to mind for me is actually Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Um, I, obviously on this show the they're going to have a lot of fun with the the snarking and the fighting and I think we all enjoyed watching Bucky and Sam snark at each other and hate each other in the movies right that's fun mm-hmm. some fun stuff but I think that when I think of kind of the ideal buddy comedy that one always comes to mind because the thing that's so beautiful about Bill and Ted <laughs> as opposed to almost every other buddy comedy, it is the least toxic masculine of all these stories because Bill and Ted love each other wholly, unconditionally. Without shame. (laughs) Yeah, without shame. And there's no homophobia um, underlying it. There's no trying to pretend that they're not close or, or thinking that there's, there's something wrong with two men that are this close. Um, 
And I, I would kind of hope that that's where the show is heading. Like that's kind of the end goal. And there is a, there is a rich tradition of, um, buddy narratives that involve men who are very, very close um, and sort of participate in what literary critics tend to call the homosocial, right? So as opposed to homosexual or homoerotic, which have sexual overtones or undertones, right? The homosocial is a way of describing intimate male relation, male or female relationships, sort of same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, one of the most popular topics of conversation among literary critics for this is Sherlock Holmes and Watson, right? Who have kind of both of them in the, over the course of the narrative, essentially kind of abandoned the conventional nuclear family for each other um, and form this crucial friendship that sort of touts different kinds of values. Um, I mean, people have written about this, have traced this back to the, to antiquity, to Achilles and Patroclus in the in the Iliad, um, but there's something really important about Sherlock Holmes and Watson as as sort of homosocial figures because they are of modernity and of an of an era of the modern state. And I do think that you know there there's real potential here for questioning sort of conceptions of masculine friendship that um, a lot of you know buddy films haven't quite. I, I think maybe haven't quite gone far enough. I mean, Bill and the thing with Bill and Ted, which I love is that it's a straight up, it's straight, it's just comedy, right? Mm -hmm. There's no drama sort of in that. Um, And I feel like sometimes when, you know, buddy comedies, they tend to either press towards comedy on the homosocial dimensions or they press towards drama, but finding a middle ground between those, I think is, is, is a powerful possibility for this, for this show. Yeah, it's worth remembering that the thing that they have in common, these two characters, very explicitly in the Captain America series, is that both are trauma victims, that they're recovering from trauma from war. Yeah. Sam is shown leading a support group in Winter Soldier of, you know, vets coming back from the war. And while the movie's got a light hand with it, the implication, of course, is that the Iraq war is difficult for people in the same way Vietnam was because in a way that like Captain America, him, like Steve Rogers, maybe didn't completely understand because they were pointless wars yeah. that you you went, you sacrificed a lot and for what? And I think that added to people's trauma in Vietnam and added people's trauma in Iraq and Bucky has the same problem. Unlike Steve, both of them have a history of fighting bad wars. Well, and that's, that's actually really crucial because this is not, it doesn't seem so far. I mean, just from the clips we've seen and trailers, this isn't your standard war story, Mm -hmm. right? So this is not band of brothers, right? So band (laughs) of brothers is a, it's essentially a buddy story, right? Right. Where war provides the vehicle for flattening the differences between people and forging friendship in spite of the fact, in spite of adversity. Right. Yeah. And I do think there, there could be, there could be, I mean, I don't know. It's what I really, it's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that there's something really meaty in here about, about the politics of friendship. So, you know, war stories tend to subsume friendship inside of the ideology of wartime, that we become friends even though we wouldn't be friends otherwise, and isn't this cool and wonderful and we can all feel good about it. The thing is, is that, and of course, you know, a a Captain America or soldiers in general are, you know, they they are conscripted or, 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 They've committed themselves. They're either conscripted or have committed themselves to the idea of war. Yeah. Right. So, but there are alternatives to the way that we are, we are joined together in civil society, right? Like war is not the only place where we put aside our differences and work together towards a common good, Mm -hmm. right? There's a, you know, William James, 19th, early 20th century philosopher has an essay that is called the moral alternative to war. And he literally takes head on the problem of the fact that in modern democracies, the one place where we put aside all of our differences is when we have a common enemy. And he says, let's take a second to think about whether or not there is something other than war that would drive us to unify ourselves like that, 
like put aside all of these differences and or reckon with those differences. So, I mean, you know what I, I would love to see, and you know, maybe it's, maybe this is asking too much. <laughs> it might be, it might be asking too much for, you know, Falcon and the Winter Soldier to like take up the call of William James. Um, <laughs> You know, who knows? Uh, but, you know, can friendship, can friendship be, a, can there be a politics of friendship that allows us to think about working towards a common good in the face of, in spite of, accounting for our differences? I mean, that is the television show for the moment. That's the thing we need right now. <laughs> it is the thing we need right now in the wake of Trump. Well, you know, there's a non-zero chance that Baron Zemo actually winds up on their side and could actually play the role you're describing, wherein they find a friendship and overlook their differences in previous battles. I don't know. It's not out of the question, Maeve. I mean, I think it, there's definitely a, a story to be told if they wanted to tell it about this being a redemption arc yeah. for each character. Again, you have Sam who fought in Iraq or the the Marvel version of it. Yeah. You have Bucky who was an assassin and then you have Zemo who has a lot to like answer for. Yeah. And like that could be a story about our nation actually coming together to do exactly this and to to come together in redemption of some of our our past faults and flaws as opposed to just fighting a common enemy. Especially if, if like coming together means that we don't actually put aside our differences, that we actually try to find a way to account for difference of, di differences of experience that different communities have, right? That yeah. a, a Black American a Captain America is going to have a different experience of America than a working class white boy, which, yeah. you know, again, is, you know. <laughs> from the 40s. From the 40s. Right, no from less. the 40s, yeah, exactly. right? So we're not reducing those differences. We're acknowledging them. We're seeing the other. And we're saying, I see you, I hear you, let's come up with a politics that accounts for you and me and all of this. I don't know if it's a more modest or a more ambitious option, but the one I'm hoping that they rely on is White Men Can't Jump. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a basketball movie. I would argue it is very much like a superhero movie. They have <laughs> awesome costumes. They <laughs> joke and quip on the battlefield and they demonstrate elite physical skills. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty much a superhero movie. But in reality, this movie came out between the public awareness of the Rodney King beating and then those cops getting acquitted. So it mm. came out at a very specific moment in L.A. history and captured a lot about the feelings of that time. And it also avoided the homogeneity that so many white filmmakers would have put on that situation, showing different neighborhoods, having very different personalities and subcultures. It was definitely still a white-led project, but a lot of people of color had leadership roles across the production from the costumes to the court choreography to the locations. And Rosie Perez has talked a lot about the filmmaking team for actually listening to her when they were making that movie. She beat out a lot of white ladies for that role. It was supposed to be a white lady in the script huh. originally, including Holly Hunter, by the way. I did not know that. Uh, there's a great 2018 essay in an, on a website called Hollywood Suite by Cameron Maitland called What White Men Can't Jump Got Right and Why You Should Watch It. Hmm. And some of this stuff has really come out of there. But there's a moment in that movie where she rejects a dress that Woody Harrelson's character brings to her. And that came directly out of an experience in the filmmaking process wherein she was presented with this dress and was just like, <laughs> hell no. And they developed a scene in the movie around that. And I would hope that this show does it something similar where it listens to the who these characters are through the actors, but also the issues that they face, right? So White Men Can't Jump is not perfect. Parts of it have not aged well, just like any movie from the 90s that is trying to inject issues of race and class as part of its story. But it did try to inject them. It did not look away from them. And I guess my hope is just that Falcon and the Winter Soldier does the same. I do not expect it to be a radical treatise on any of this. I just hope they don't look away and that they put it where it belongs when it really matters. Look, um, can I just say that, uh, you know, to the to whoever who has this kind of power listening to this show, um, can we get a, a say no to the dress hosted by Rosie Perez? Because that would be, <laughs> that would oh be great. Uh, I would be here for that. Uh, sorry. No, I mean, the nut. <laughs> in all seriousness. I want to watch the, that show. <laughs> 
I would totally watch that show, right? Like, say no to the dress. And it could be in all kinds of contexts, like, you know, not just a bride, but, you know, in all, you know, places where women are told what to wear. Like, yeah. no, thank you. I'm Rosie Perez is that. like, just, yeah, no, we won't go down this rabbit hole anymore. <laughs> I just want to see that show. Yeah. That sounds great. But what I, but I, what I will say is like, Mark, there is, there is something deeply poignant to just the phrase, let's not look away. Let's not look away hmm. from the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. I mean, if American politics has failed over the last, uh, <laughs> I don't basically since I've been alive, since I've known what politics is. I mean, I remember since the reconstruction, maybe. I yeah. Don't know. I mean, I remember, I remember Reagan. I'm dating myself a little bit here. I remember, I mean, I don't remember enough about Reagan, but I remember my parents like hating him. Um, <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad, <laughs> if that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, but my my point is, is like the that the the look away the the I, I'm uncomfortable because this is getting politically uneasy for me. Mm-hmm. America needs a, a recommitment as an American principle, hopefully embodied by a figure like Captain America, which says, "Do not look away, do yeah. not look away from injustice, do not look away from the stuff that makes you uncomfortable." Let's look and listen and engage, and then let's make a better world on the basis of what we see and hear and want. On that note, thank you both so much for all of this insight. I have really enjoyed this, and you've made me, I didn't know it was possible, even more excited (laughs) for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. (laughs) Now it's just going to let us way down. (laughs) I know. We have to be careful to not do the story cast (laughs) version of theory cast, where we got ourselves all tied up in a bunch of exciting theories. And then it didn't happen. We have to hold both ideas in our head at once, which I know you're both very excellent at, but that we have these ambitious hopes for it. But we just, the main thing is there's a baseline of success. I hope they cross that. And then however much they get into our dream versions of it, we'll have to discuss on a week to week basis. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Amanda, thank you so much for being on this preview of Falcon and the Warner Soldier. Thank you for having me. Maeve, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. (laughs) All right, Audio Avengers, that is going to do it for us today. We've got two more unique previews for Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming your way this week, so stay tuned on the Marvelous TV Club. And if you can, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or simply tell a friend about our show. Anything you can do to help us spread the word would mean the world to us. Until next time, my Marvels, To Dr. Adam's secret lair, I hear she has snacks. (laughs) (laughs) And cocktails. Mm.